New York City has a whole lot of history, not just in finance or entertainment or tourism, but also religious history, specifically in the neighborhood of Morningside Heights in uptown Manhattan. There are a series of three major churches and a seminary that holds the history of the Protestant and Episcopal religions here in New York. Let's explore the churches of Uptown Manhattan. I'm Ariel with Urbanist, and right now we're standing in front of the longest cathedral in the entire world, the sixth largest cathedral by area in the entire world, and the largest Anglican cathedral in the world. It holds a whole lot of records, and for good reason. It's a magnificent church, and we can't really fully grasp its height and size basically from any angle because the church conforms to the city grid system. Let's walk around and explore the strange sculptures, the, the interesting reliefs on the front of the churches, and also at the end see the tallest church in all of the United States of America. So hello everyone, I'm Ariel. I explore cities all around the world and let's explore Cathedral of St. John the Divine for our first stop. However, before we go into the cathedral, right now we're within the grounds of the cathedral known as the Cathedral Close. Within the Cathedral Close on the side of this magnificent structure, is one of the strangest sculptures in all of New York. But wait, I'm not going to tell you the name yet. I want you to guess what the name is. Let's talk about this sculpture by Greg Wyatt. So right here, since I can't walk inside the park area because it's closed due to the pandemic, I'll show you from a distance uh, along with some video of this. This is a statue of the Archangel Michael defeating Lucifer, also known by the title of Satan, or you can pronounce it in the modern way, Satan. Now, Satan is a title for meaning the opposer. It can literally be appointed to anyone, but at the time, Lucifer was the appointed Satan, and Mark Angel, or the Archangel Michael decapitates Satan. And this sculpture depicts a DNA helix spinning around. There is the decapitated head of Satan. There is crabs, uh, nine giraffes, the sun and the moon smiling, looking very peaceful, uh, a few lions, and um, the Archangel Michael being embraced by one of the most peaceful animals in the world. So. Why is this gruesome statue here in New York? Well, it doesn't symbolize death. It symbolizes life and it symbolizes peace. It's called the Peace Fountain. It was designed by Greg Wyatt. Now, within the grounds of Cathedral St. John the Divine, there's a whole lot of gems. And amongst one of the older buildings of the entire neighborhood is right there and that used to be the orphan asylum the entire cathedral close is landmarked but where are we in new york city where well, we're currently in the neighborhood of morningside heights which is uptown manhattan about 110th street on the one train stop so let's walk around and see the front of cathedral saint john the divine hello sarah hello lucy thank you so much for the stars uh, Kay, you're watching me through YouTube. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, hello, Kenny. Hello, Jennifer. Here is an older woman sleeping. But actually, it's not an older woman sleeping. It's just a statue of an older woman sleeping. And she seems to be suffering from stigmata. Stigmata is... A religious experience someone goes through where they experience all the different injuries that Jesus Christ 
experienced during his crucifixion. It's also in honor of the many poor communities that they service here because this is an Episcopal church. So before we continue, let me actually just show you the sculpture from the front. I think here's a good view. Highly recommend coming to see this sculpture. Really cool. church that we're seeing here right now is Episcopal. Now what is Episcopal? Well, Episcopal is closely associated with the Anglican Church and this is their sigil. Now we know cathedrals to be very Roman Catholic. So why is there an Episcopal Cathedral? And what is a cathedral in the first place? Well, cathedral comes from the Greek word cathedra. And cathedra means seat. Hence, any building called a cathedral is the seat of a bishop. That applies to Roman Catholicism. That also applies to the Anglican and the Episcopal Church. This building was built in the 1890s. It started construction in 1892 for one very powerful reason. And that's because the very rich Episcopalians, Episcopalians tend to be the aristocrats of New York City, very rich in money and also very politically connected. In the 18 80s, they noticed that St. Patrick's Cathedral was built in Midtown Manhattan. Now, St. Patrick's Cathedral is one of the most famous cathedrals in the entire world. It's also the most visited religious structure in New York City, but it's Roman Catholic. A lot of the servants of these Episcopalian families were Irish, recently Irish immigrants. They haven't even become Irish Americans yet. And they were worshiping at one of the most beautiful cathedrals in all of the United States of America. However, the Episcopalians were stuck worshiping in tiny little uh, churches along Fifth Avenue. So they wanted, they felt a little bit jealous and they wanted to build a religious structure that would be as big and as grandiose as the St. Patrick's Cathedral, maybe even bigger. So here it is. Now this I mentioned is 121 thousand square feet big by area 600 and feet long the size of two american football fields and this was the original plan of the church it was going to be done in the rome romanesque byzantium style however it didn't fully fulfill that vision as we can see here because the first two architects that won the competition to build this structure was Heinz and Lafarge. Heinz and Lafarge were already working on the grand stations of the IRT, which was the modern day subway station, the uh, modern day subway system that crisscrosses all around New York. They built, for example, the station in Bowling Green. They built the station nearby here at 110th Street. They were working under a man called Belmont. He was the owner of the IRT and one of the main donors of St. John the Divine. Hence, they were favorites of his and they were picked. However, George Hines died out of meningitis. Lafarge was fired because tastes for the Romanesque Byzantium style changed and this man, a very deeply religious architect named Ralph Cram, was hired. He ended up building a Gothic style cathedral. So we know what cathedral is, but what is Gothic? Well, first of all, let's discuss what is Episcopal. Well, Episcopal is closely related to Anglican. However, there's one caveat. The Anglican Church is known as the Church of England. 
However, we had a huge revolution, and we booted out the English from America. The English weren't so pleased. So when the Americans started their own church, they called it the Episcopal Church of the United States of America, they needed bishops in order to officiate this church. They weren't going to go full on Protestant because Anglicans aren't really Protestant. They're more closely related to Roman Catholics because the separation happened around the time of the Protestant Reformation, but not associated with it. It's a much more longer history. But the short end version of it is the Americans went over to England and asked for bishops. The English said, oh no, go away you traitors. And they were left without any bishops. They were left without any leadership. Who were they going to get from a leader? Well, luckily the Church of Scotland was recently formed, also separating from the Roman Catholic Church. And the Church of Scotland, who was the original Episcopal Church, went over to the American Episcopals and said, we'll give you some bishops. And they gave them their first bishop, Bishop Samuel Seabury, hence forming the Episcopal Church that we know here today in America. Not the same one as the Church of Scotland, which is also Episcopal. However, what is a Gothic-style cathedral? Well, that we have to look at the arch right here. This arch is rather pointed. Arches used to be just round, but when they started getting pointed in France, that's when things really changed. So, things really changed with this man, Abbot Sugar, who I have an image of him right here. Abbot Sugar changed the game for everyone because he wanted, one, build a church which was much larger than the typical churches that you would see dotted all around Italy. I visit many of them in Rome. They're small. He wanted much more capacity. Second, the Roman churches tend to be kind of dark. He wanted to enhance the churches with light because he believed that light will elevate the soul towards salvation. So Albert Sugar used a new engineering technique, which was the pointed arch, which is right here, and built the very first Gothic cathedral, which was Saint Denis in France. That changed the game for everyone because suddenly cathedrals could be large, like the interior of St. John the Divine. I wish I could show you the inside, but it's only open for worship at this moment, not for sightseeing. Here's a look, a look inside, filled with light. And here it is. And here's the construction. So Ralph Cram made this more Gothic, but what is the name St. John the Divine? Well, St. John the Divine is also known as John of Patmos. Here's a depiction of him, a Renaissance painting, and he was the divinator. Not divine as is that he was godly, but he divined visions from God. These were the book of Revelation. He's depicted right there in the front. So you can see him as a divinator. So the entire facade is a reference to the Revelation. But the Revelation might be familiar if you're familiar with religious teachings, especially if you went to Catholic school or you went to uh, Anglican school or Episcopal school. You'll be really familiar with Revelation. It's a very dark book. It depicts a sacrificial lamb coming to earth, being pierced, bleeding. Inside its body is a scroll warning of the four horsemen of the apocalypse that if our world gets submerged in a obsession of economics and war we will be dragged down into an apocalypse an end of times a reset for humanity and here we see the very symbolism 
of that apocalypse. With the most striking image in this portal of paradise, the main bay, we see New York City covered in a mushroom cloud. With the Twin Towers prominently in the front. But wait a minute. Is this a reference to 9-11? No. This, all these sculptures that depict all the main figures of the New Testament, of the Old Testament, who end up becoming referenced in the New Testament, from Mekizeldeck all the way to uh, Noah, Samuel, Isaiah, Jacob, etc. This, all of these sculptures were built between the 1980s and the 1990s. Simon Verite was the head sculptor. This depiction of New York City engulfed in war with the Twin Towers toppling down was made almost 10 years before the attacks of September 11, 2001. Did they have some foresight? Is this a symbol of the end times? Who knows? Another depiction here, we have see more chaos here. And these are very modern images among more chaos here. A school bus, cars being dragged down, down, down into the fiery pits of hell. Souls rising up. Ghosts and ghouls coming out to the earth. John the Baptist being birthed by his mother. And here we see a hidden image of uh, embryonic or St. John the Baptist inside an embryo. In the middle we have more of St. John. A massive bronze door. Huge bronze door. Look at that. And here we have another depiction of political turmoil. But wait a minute. Was this made like today? People protesting in front of the capital of the United States of America? No. Again, this was made more than 30 years ago. It was referencing more than the 1980s, where there was also political strife. However, there's more controversial symbols here inside the portal of paradise. Because we have something that belongs to Jewish mystics. If anyone's familiar with the Kabbalah, this is the main symbol. This is the tree of life. It represents the entire cosmos. Everything that is, everything that ever was, everything that will be is symbolized within the tree of life. From the heavenly realm above the lower circle, all the way to source, the God in the top. But why do we have a Jewish mystic symbol inside this cathedral? Well, that gets to a more interesting point in the history of St. John the Divine. One of the very first donors was a man by the name of John D. Rockefeller Jr. Here's an image of him. But who was John D. Rockefeller Jr.? He was the son of the oil magnate, John D. Rockefeller Sr. He was one of the most richest men in all of America on the ranks of J.P. Morgan and Andrew Carnegie. If John D. Rockefeller was alive today, his net worth would be $300 billion. So John D. Rockefeller wanted also a church for non-Catholics or Protestants slash Anglicans. The Rockefeller family were deeply religious, but they weren't denominational. They technically were part of the Baptist Church, or one of the sections of the Baptist Church. I think it was the United Church, the United Baptist Church. 
but they weren't really picky about what specific denomination they were a part of. So John D. Rockefeller gave $500,000 to build this church. However, with one caveat, he would give more money if they took more progressive views. In the beginning, the church said, no, we're not that progressive. So John D. Rockefeller pulled funding and they had to find funding from the other aristocrats of New York, being the Astors, the real estate moguls, the Vanderbilts, the railroad tycoons, and J.P. Morgan, the richest man on earth. Oh, sorry. Ken, of course, all this info is in New York City history books. You know what, Ken? Um, you'll be hard pressed sometimes to even find this amount of detail in the New York City history books. Especially when it comes to religious history, which is a shame. That's why I like digging a little bit deeper. Cheryl says, interesting Jewish mystic tree of life, beautiful church, love, you're looking great, love your mask. Thank you so much, Gail. Looks like the Trajan pillar in Rome. Thank you for showing us the, explaining the fascinating details, says Donald. And Cheryl says, oh, I like churches. Oh yeah, I'm glad you like churches. We're gonna go see two, two more. And I love that you could show images at the same time, says Kenny and Michael from Brooklyn, hello. Thanks for showing us something different while we're quarantining at home, it says Andrea. My pleasure, Paula, hello. Donald says, Anglica is also the Church of England, that is correct. And they're also in Canada. Thank you for clarifying. And it looks so old, Gothic, like ter Gothic churches in France. Well, the reason this looks so old is because it's built in the same style as the great Gothic cathedrals in France and in England. It's not made with anything steel. It doesn't really even have, I think, a wooden frame. It's stone upon stone upon more stone. More religious symbolism right there with the name of the ambulance, which is Mount Sinai. And there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Now, it's also known as St. John the Unfinished because only two thirds of it is complete, which is kind of a bummer. Now, Ed Koch, what? Yeah, it's a beautiful church. What? City? Yeah, I'm from the city, yeah. Yeah, me too. Likewise. What? Sorry. Oh, 9/11. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Huh? Oh, I'm I'm filming. I'm making a video about the history of the church. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Uh, no, no, no. Thank you. But it was awesome meeting you. Have a great day. Uh, so. I was gonna say this is also known as Saint John the Unfinished because only two thirds of the church is built. We see kind of a quarter of a tower and no tower here at all. Well, in the middle of this church, there was supposed to be a 401 foot tall tower or even more. The plans could have gone even higher. This by far would have made it the tallest church ever, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, sorry for the interruption. Um, there was a man who stepped right beside me asking where I'm from, and he was speaking very, very, very low. So I kept asking, you know, say, huh, <laughs> like speak louder. And he kept getting closer to me, and then he wanted to give me an elbow bump. But not during these times. No, thank you. <laughs> All right, back to the tour. Now, I mentioned the Episcopals were among the richest uh, families. Well, the reason they're the richest is because they own very good real estate. They were here since the very beginning of New York City. And Cathedral of St. John the Divine is among one of those real estate holders. They end up leasing for 99 years to this residential building, two of them, right here. It's actually pretty cool. They combine with the look of St. John the Divine. So here's a little bit more St. John the Divine on the side. Mm. 
Let me show you a little bit more. We're right next to a hospital, so there's a lot of um, ambulances around. Ooh, here we can see a little bit more. And here is uh, the sculptures being made inside. Lots of sculptures all around. And here's a depiction uh, earlier of the Arch Archangel Michael slaying Satan. And this is a plan of the church. Now, the church from ground level on the human perspective looks awe-inspiring. But it's also supposed to look awe-inspiring from a heavenly perspective. If you were God, if you were a heavenly being, this church will look like a cross from above. So it's uh, supposed to be both awe-inspiring for humans and also for God or any other heavenly being. Let's cross. So let's go to our second stop. Say goodbye to St. John the Divine, St. John the Unfinished. Ed Koch in the 1990s joked around that St. John, oh, Catholic, uh, Gothic cathedrals in Europe take hundreds of years to construct. And this one is no exception. So come back in 500 years and maybe we'll be finished. Right here, we have one of the few gatehouses still surviving. And the gatehouses are among the oldest structures of this neighborhood. They used to be protecting the Croton Aqueduct, which served water to New York City. It was all hidden underground. Let's continue walking through. <laughs> Cheryl says, bye, second stop. <laughs> bye. Uh, and second stop, here we go. Yes, we're going to our second stop. Here's the hospital, Mount Sinai. Huge hospital. Cathedral St. John the Divine was also used uh, for, for people suffering from COVID as well. Here, ladies and gentlemen, we see our first building of the massive Columbia University. Now, Columbia University also holds its roots in the Anglican Church when it used to be called King's College. Now, you might recognize the name King's College because there's a Queen's College. Uh, but beyond that, it's also a lyric in the musical Hamilton because Alexander Hamilton was one of the earlier students of King's College, which used to be in downtown Manhattan, around the area of City Hall. And Ken, I'm so happy you're enjoying it. As you probably already know, these are live videos. And they're not as structured as city tours either. That's because I prefer kind of a looser structure. And that's what Urbanist is all about. Exploring as if you were exploring with a friend. Rather than the tour guide or a professor. Alright, now let's go to Columbia University. So King's College was an Anglican university or college at that point and then later became a university. However, also again due to the revolution, things got split off. 
So we are walking now up Amsterdam Avenue. We're going northward past 116th Street. Is it hot? Yes. Hello, Elias. Hello, CB. So we're 115th in Amsterdam, 116th in Amsterdam. This is the map. We're right now in Columbia University, which you see right dead center. And we're going to our second stop, which is St. Paul's Chapel. And here are our three stops. I'll be posting these photos in the comments afterwards. So what is Columbia University? Well, before Columbia University moved uptown, it was the Bloomingdale Insane Asylum. Yep, it was a mental institution. Asylum nor insane is politically correct anymore. So the modern term would be mental institution. And that was the structure that predated Columbia University. However, all around, well, they always do think, they want to, want to right see. underneath our feet is a series of underground tunnels. And these series of underground tunnels crisscross from building to building. They also predate Columbia University because they were the secret tunnels of the Bloomingdale Insane Asylum. Now all the buildings we're seeing all around us were made by one architectural firm, mostly by one architectural firm, Stanford, well, McKim, Mead, and White. One of them being Stanford White. They were among the most prolific New York City architects, definitely among the most famous. Stanford White also built the Washington Square Park Arc, Arch, and also the Players Club, the facade at least, and Nikola Tesla's lab in Long Island. However, there's one secret here in the alma mater. Let's take a closer approach. Here's McKim Medium White. They designed these gorgeous buildings all around us. This is one of the most famous campuses in the entire world. Uh, it was featured in countless movies. Among my favorites is uh, Spider-Man and also a great film starring Joseph Gordon-Levitt called Premium Rush. Let me know if you know any other movies that took place here. Here is Alma Mater. Now Alma, Alma Mater is not a Catholic or Christian figure. Predates that. She is a version of Minerva, or before Minerva, Athena slash Columbia. They're all kind of mishmashed together to make Alma Mater, and she's the symbol of graduation, the symbol of knowledge. But Minerva's main pet or companion was a little owl, or owls in general. She was surrounded by owls. However, owls symbolize not general knowledge, but secret knowledge. And here is an owl hidden inside Alma Mater's gown. You can see him right there. His eyes are peeking. So I'm moving the camera and you can kind of see, get a sense of how he looks like. I can zoom in right there. there we go. So there we go, Alma Mater. Let's continue on to St. Paul's Chapel. If you have any questions, feel free to ask and let me know 
where you are watching from. If you watched many, many times, let me know exactly where you are. I'm curious, are you in your backyard? Are you watching while doing transcendental meditation? Are you working in your garden? Are you walking the dog? Are you walking a cat? Let me know. And is it hot? Yes, it is. Let me get to shade quickly. Here we have St. Paul's Chapel. Not to be confused with St. Paul's Chapel in downtown Manhattan, also known as the little chapel that stood. And that's another famous chapel. This one is right inside the campus of Columbia University, and it's built in the Renaissance Revival style. This was constructed by Isaac Newton Stokes, Phelps Stokes, Isaac Newton Phelps Stokes. He had a, quite a long name. Another religious man, united by his uh, two sisters that were involved in the fundraising of building this church. Now, on top of the church, we have one of the biggest freestanding domes in all of New York City. I think it's one of the biggest freestanding domes in all of the United States, among 91, sto uh, 91 feet in diameter. And why is this a Renaissance style? Why is it not called Gothic? Well, we have two main differences. One, this is not a pointed arch. This is not a pointed arch. That's not an arch at all, it's square. That right there is not a pointed arch at all. These are not pointed arches. And because they're not pointed arches, weight is distributed on the sides. And because it's distributed on the sides, it needs more brick and stone. It needs more weight or steel frame if you were to build it out of steel. The pointed arch that we saw in Cathedral St. John Divine, uh, Divine distributes weight down, down into the bedrock. And here we're amongst the oldest, I mean, amongst the highest places in all Manhattan. So we have a lot of bedrock right underneath us. And that's the main difference. Let's take a look from the front. You asked what we're doing, says Donald. Uh, I'm taking a break from writing a short story. Oh, cool, Donald. That's awesome you're writing a short story. Please share it with the urbanists uh, when you're finished with it, if you're posting it uh, publicly. And you're watching from your couch in front of your fan, says Susie. Oh, I'm glad. Lori's lounging by the pool in Arizona. Oh, nice. Fulton is a lovely day here in Scotland after days of rain. <laughs> I couldn't imagine. Having sun must feel really good. It does feel good here as well. And watching from Las Vegas while watching from home. Love your tour, says Karen. Uh, Janet, watching from Rotterdam. And hello, Petrine. Bienvenidos, gracias por mirando. And here it is. St. Paul's Chapel. I wish I could show it to you from the inside again. But I'll that these uh, rounded arches 